Well, thank you. It's so wonderful to welcome you all to the gallery. It's great to see so many friends and especially my family here today. Thank you for being here. Um, this, as we just heard, is the second half of a two-part program in Imaging New Haven. And today's topic is Engaging the City. Um, this time of year with the International Festival of Arts and Ideas is always a favorite for all of us here at the gallery. Um, the rich partnering potential of all of the ideas programming is, is terrific for us and we thank you for that collaboration year in and year out. It's just a privilege to be part of. For today's conversation, um, we're going to welcome three speakers, writer Nicholas Davidoff, photographer Lisa Carezzi, and architectural historian and documentary filmmaker L. Hugh Rubin. All of these three um, people engage with cities and with the city of New Haven in particular from their unique academic and artistic positions. Today's conversation will be an exploration of ways to learn from New Haven, and if possible, if it's even possible to sort of capture the city, and if it is, to what ends this sort of capturing is a valuable pursuit. This panel um, follows yesterday's discussion about the book and exhibition project, Candy, A Good and Spacious Land, with the four contributors to the project, photographers Jim Goldberg and Donovan Wiley, and writers Laura Wexler and Christopher Clattell. I want to take one moment to thank all of you again. You're all in the audience. It was a terrific conversation last night. And as I mentioned yesterday, Candy, a good and spacious land, grew out of Goldberg and Wiley's time here as Happy and Bob artist, um, Doran artists in residence. And it was through this residency that they created this moving and insightful portrait of New Haven. Um, that you'll find upstairs on the fourth floor in the exhibition, and also as you pursue the beautiful two-volume set of books that um, these collaborators can all contributed to. So what I thought I'd do today is just introduce our three speakers in order, and all right now at the start, and then let them come up one after the other and um, make a few remarks for about 10 or so minutes each, and then we will I'll come up to the stage for a conversation and um, shortly thereafter open the conversation to all of your questions and answers. So first up will be Nicholas Davidoff, who is the author of five books, including The Fly Swatter, a Pulitzer Prize finalist, The Crowd Sounds Happy, his memoir of his New Haven childhood, and the best-selling The Catcher Was a Spy, The Mysterious Life of Mo Berg, which has just been filmed for a forthcoming movie starring Paul Rudd, Paul Giamatti, and Guy Pearce. He contributes to The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, and The New Republic, and has been a Guggenheim Fellow, a Berlin Prize Fellow of the American Academy, and the Anschutz Distinguished Fellow at Princeton. Following Nicholas, Lisa Carezzi is a critic in photography and the Director of Undergraduate Studies in, in Art at the Yale School of Art where she received her MFA in 2000. Her work is in the collections of the Met, the Whitney, the New Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, and others. In 2003, she was granted a commission to photograph Governor's Island by the Public Art Fund, which culminated in a 2004 exhibition catalog, Governor's Island, in which she explored what was left behind on a former Army and Coast Guard base, just a, a stone's throw from Manhattan. She has two other monographs in print, Fantasies from 2008, which explored the burlesque revivalist movement, and Joe's Junkyard um, from 2012 that examines her own family's achievement and subsequent loss of the American dream. That series is currently on view at the Mike Kelly Mobile Homestead at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Detroit. Uh, third up will be Elihu Rubin an architectural historian, city planner, and documentary filmmaker. He received a master's of city planning and a PhD in the history of architecture and urbanism at UC Berkeley. And as an urban historian, Al Hugh has focused on post-war urban redevelopment, and he's the author of Ensuring the City, the Prudential Center and Post-War Urban Landscape, which was published by Yale Press in 2012. After graduating from Yale College in 1999, 
Elihu formed a documentary film company, American Beat, and co-directed a number of films about New Haven, including On Broadway, um, treating the evolution of that nearby retail district. As an associate professor of architecture, urbanism, and American studies here at Yale, he teaches courses on the built environment and on the production of space. Today, he's going to talk about the range of student-driven projects in New Haven that he's organized as part of his Yale seminars, I believe. So I think we'll just dive right in and get started. We want to leave plenty of time for conversation, and I'll invite you up, Nicholas. So thank you, Pam. And um, I just wanted to congratulate Jim and Donovan and Laura and Chris for their vivid and really affecting um, project photographs and the things that have been written. It's, um, it's a beautiful exhibition and a beautiful book. And I hope you all have the chance to see it. And I want to wish everybody a happy Blooms Day, even though I myself am a Dubliners guy. Um, <laughs> and I'm also a guy who always brings along his spontaneous remarks. So. Um, Bear with me. <laughs> so when you're talking about where you grow up as a child and what you will do with your life, it's two kinds of what a child sees. One kind of seeing is absorbing your physical surroundings, how you see who you are in relation to the natural and the built landscape. The other has to do with the people you observe around you, what kind of a future they seem to promise for you. In my time, my New Haven has been a city divine, defined by two different kinds of populations. There's the college and university New Haven, most conspicuously Yale, a great research institution and dyna dynamic means of American ascent. As a kid with a well-educated yet poor, busy and stressed single mother, I often felt caught outside it all in New Haven growing up here and completely out of it. I was not part of Yale, not of the great institution, or really part of any other significant institution, including a two-parent family. The outsider is a familiar role for any kind of creative person. So the first image. The great Swiss-born immigrant New York photographer Robert Frank has spent his outsider life thinking about American outsiders. Ever since I first encountered Robert Frank's classic book, The Americans, it has meant more to me than almost any other book. There's one New Haven photograph in The Americans. A weary, forlorn, older man sits on a bench on Yale commencement day, looking away from the line of young marching graduates. My mother and father came to New Haven when my father attended Yale Law School. Shortly afterwards, when I was three and we were living in Washington, D.C., my father completely fell apart. Was so ill and violent, we fled here to New Haven without him. My father then went to New York City, where he was frequently homeless or institutionalized and always terrifying to me as a little kid, well, throughout my boyhood. And looking at Robert Frank's commencement day New Haven man, I always imagined the man the way I saw myself as a child here, a person watching the world of promise pass him by. Part of that feeling was, of course, because of my dad's true experience. The great sorrows of his, his illness were his own failed hopes. The next image. And then alongside Yale, there is the other working New Haven defined by industrial production, by struggle and labor, and by neighborhoods formed of the optimistic migrations of working families from places like Italy, Poland, Ireland, Central and South America, and the great African-American Southern migration to the promised land of job-filled northern cities like this one. In particular, the Winchester Gun Factory in Newhallville, in dire need of labor, implored upon African-American Southerners to come here, offering entry-level positions and also potential career arcs, the promise of promotions. At one point, more than 15,000 people worked at Winchester in New Haven. The Great Migration is why you still see so many South Carolina license plates, South Carolina, also North Carolina and Georgia, license plates in New Newhallville and around New Haven. The next image. Lewis Hine was a University of Chicago trained sociologist turned photographer whose wonderful pictures were explicit pieces of reform journalism, were part of his effort to advocate for child labor laws, improved working conditions in steel and fabric mills, for better living conditions in the American rural south. In this Lewis Hine image of a young New Haven newsboy, I notice the bought books sign is cropped here as ought books, making me think 
the photographer believes that kid should be in school instead of selling his reading materials to other people. Seeing the working kid in tattered clothes reminds me of my own childhood in the sense that from the time I was this boy's age, I was often ashamed of having a terrifying and unemployed father, him such a terrible shame I never talked about it with anybody. The one shameful aspect of him I couldn't hide, of course, was his absence, personal and financial. I recall that I expressed that shame sideways by my all out of proportion dismay about my always tattered sneakers and clothing. As I got older, I decided you couldn't do anything about a missing father except I could have jobs, and the jobs could get me better clothes. To that end, from the time I was at Worthington Hooker Elementary School, on my own time, I was always mowing, raking, shoveling, delivering, stocking. I maintained the tennis courts at the Long Club in New Haven, and I spent two college summers at the end of the conveyor belt at Lehman Brothers Factory on Foster Street. Likewise, this Lewis Hine photograph reminds me of my recurrent self-scolding feeling as a boy in New Haven, that I should never, ever indulge in self-pity because all around me in what was becoming a post-industrial New Haven were children and grown-ups who had it way worse than I did. Everywhere were forlorn Robert Frank people dressed as Lewis Hine people, all these Americans who the world really was passing by. As for me, unlike my conception of the boy in the photograph, I had a full bookshelf and I had full scholarships. Like the boy, I was white. Next image. Whether you're a plumber, a college professor, a master mechanic, a musician, or a race car driver, it's easier to join an exclusive profession requiring real difficult skills if you know people who have done it know how it can be done. That's one reason so many Major League Baseball players raise Major League Baseball player children. My childhood world was defined by coming of age books about outsiders like Johnny Tremaine and Laura Ingalls Wilder and Amos Fortune and Tom Sawyer and Maya Antonia. Reading about outsiders was fine, but being a writer seemed completely impossible to me. How did you become one? Then I met Eleanor Estes. She was not just an old, another older person in her 70s living on Willow Street who I convinced to hire me to shovel her sidewalk after it snowed and whose Christmas trees I put up every December and helped her to decorate. Next image. Eleanor Estes was also a well-known writer of stories I loved. Vivid, funny, insightful, moving stories, many like the Moffats and Rufus M. Sit in, set in and around New Haven. Eleanor Estes was a possible future for me in Bright Size Life, a real writer. She encouraged me by talking seriously to me and giving me inscribed presence. And that way, she was my first real writer friend, the first to say, you two can do this. November 13th, 1974. <laughs> it, 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 I just have to say that um, she didn't look like that, of course, at the time. She was this bright, warm, just flowing, you know, she was in her 70s, so elderly presence who, she was a New Haven librarian, but she was also such a warm and engaged in children person. It was so appropriate that she was writing the kinds of books that she did because whenever she was in the presence of me or my sister, and I assume other kids in the neighborhood who she was so nice to, there was just a generosity of spirit that, um, you know, to this day, it almost chokes me up a little bit because she's just really a great person. And I hope you'll take a look at her books like The Moffats. Anyway, for my friend Nikki Davidoff, super de duper salesman of our street, best wishes, Eleanor Estes. And here's The Lost Umbrella of Kim Chu, in which she writes in 1980. Short, I, hadn't, I was a junior in high school then. For Nikki Davidoff, who will remember some of the things in this book and see how they got into a book from your friend Eleanor Estes. I emphasize again just how much that means to a child who maybe she knew what I want to do with my life before I did. Next image. When you are writing about a place, you are using the specifics of that place to achieve qualities that speak to many places. The specific and particular truth becomes the broader human truth. That path of thinking is what transformed journalism into literature. How do you learn to do it? By reading great writers. And if one of them is writing about your hometown, so much the better. Wallace Stevens' long poem, An Ordinary Evening in New Haven, is for me about how a great writer's imagination works as he walks through the interior landscape of his typical day, how an abstract poet thinks in abstractions. It's a clinic of a kind, as the poet Vijay Sasadri suggests, a literary version of Bach's well-tempered 
clavier, a demonstration of how to play and how to think about what you're playing. The line in an ordinary evening in New Haven that has always meant the most to me is this one, next to love is the desire for love. In my young life, I was always outside myself, outside the action that mattered, observing it, imagining how things could be, the potent and yet self-soothing sensation of reimagining life even as you are living life. As Stephen suggests in his poem, you remove yourself from the misery that infuriates your love, and that removing gives a person some ease. Again, to write well about something, you have to engage with it, paradoxically, by moving away from it. Next image. I've been talking about how real, tangible, present examples offer possible, abstract, imagined futures for a child. If you grow up without a good father, you may, as I did, pretend to others that you have no father at all. You may also spend a lot of time looking at how the good and successful men around you live and how they do things. My grandfather, my mother's father, Alexander Gershenkron, was a double refugee from the Russian Revolution and Austrian fascism, who in this, his third country, and in his third new primary language, became the American economist who devised a theory of economic development known as the advantages of backwardness. His life became his work. His personal story became his enduring scientific idea. After I wrote a book about him called The Fly Swatter, How My Grandfather Made His Way in the World, it was time to write a companion book about my own New Haven youth. I, too, was a late starter, late to figure everything out. My voice changed when I was 18, last boy in my high school class at Hopkins. My firsts, my first kiss, and first everything else were similarly delayed, or it seemed that way to me. Your abstract perception of yourself, true or not, becomes yourself. I grew six inches in college, and yet for years after, I still thought of myself as what people used to call me, little Nicky. Now, I hope to write about my childhood, my version of the Moffats and my Antonia. But those were coming-of-age fictions, and I wanted to write a true non-fiction Bildungsroman, the sort of book I wanted to read as a boy. It helped very much to know that William Finnegan had written an extraordinary two-part report about a teenage New Haven drug dealer named Terry Jackson in The New Yorker called Out There. My book, The Crowd Sounds Happy, began by writing a piece for The New Yorker called My Father's Troubles. By extraordinary luck at this time in my life, I, I now knew many writers, and the most talented of my friends, people I deeply admired, were also overwhelmingly generous to me as I set out to write about my New Haven childhood. One of them and I talked for much of an afternoon about how chi a child sees the small stretch of sidewalk in front of his house as the center of the world, his Grand Canyon, his Great Mississippi River, his territory. Another helped me to see how important it is to braid two apparently incongruous ideas to develop deeper threads of meaning in both. My friend wrote about his divorce by yoking it with thoughts on bird watching and climate change. I wrote about my failed, sick, and disappointed father through the 1970s Boston Red Sox and the early songs of Elvis Costello. I never talked with anyone about my father until he died when I was in my 30s and I gave his eulogy. After that, a third deeply admired friend told me I should write about him. My friend said, if you write and talk about the things in life that are hard for you, your friends will feel closer to you. This next image. After many, many years in New York, I moved back to New Haven with my family four years ago. That was just after my friend, the poet Elizabeth Alexander, had experienced a terrible tragedy, the sudden death at 50 of her dear beloved husband, Fikre. Elizabeth and I used to sit in her New Haven kitchen and talk about how to turn that kind of grief into literature, how to get that sufficient distance from yourself, which of course she did in her beautiful book, The Light of the World. One thing Elizabeth and I talked about were some of the reasons I returned to New Haven. She left New Haven, understandable of course, but a great loss for all of us. It means so much to me here to have friends in my city who are writers of great talent whom I so much admire, like my pal Dwayne Betts, with whom I talk almost every day. From the time I was young, I wondered how it felt to be the real New Haven people whose inner lives I could only imagine in Robert Frank's and Lewis Hines' pictures. A section of New Haven I visited often and wondered a lot about as a child was Newhallville, the working class neighborhood next to Yale. I knew a lot of kids from Newhallville, went to school with them, and was on teams with them, but what did I really know? 
During my childhood, the Winchester Gun Factory, that one-time North Star of the Great Migration to New Haven, shut down. You can see from these comparative aerial views of New Hallville how the loss of good jobs devastates a neighborhood that had once thrived, or once there were lovely houses with stained glass windows and spiral staircases, and lush gardens where there were classy nightclubs with musicians like Etta James and Miles Davis playing regularly to packed houses, where there were mostly two-parent families with working dads little boys looked up to. I myself saw the brutal post-industrial reality on the ground in the everyday lives of the New Hallville kids I knew. Boys may wonder about the interior lives of other boys, but they typically don't ask intimate questions of one another, or I didn't, and nobody ever asked me, say, about my dad. And so thinking back to those childhood wonderings, I began my current nonfiction project, which is about what it's like to grow up as a boy in post-industrial racially segregated New Hallville, right next to Yale and yet a world away and at risk for violence. I also began to write a television show. It's dramatic fiction about a made-up American place, which imagines in a time of inequality and segregation what happens when the strong walls and borders within a city become porous. It's called Town Gown, and it's now in development with HBO. New Hallville's post-industrial predicament is a tragic American problem, our national conundrum, our national dilemma. All over this country, wealth and opportunity are juxtaposed right next to poverty and joblessness. Nobody's been able to figure out what to do. I've always considered New Haven an ideal place to think about America because it feels like America compressed. A recent 538 study said that New Haven's composition made it the most typical American city. It's also true that a Brookings Institution study placed New Haven first for rising inequality. These are important truths to be aware of. There's so much about America that is good here in New Haven, and much that is also troubling. Because it's a small city, everything's conspicuous. Everything and everybody's right over there. I feel privileged to come from and to have come from New Haven. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Nikki. I'm actually really glad that you showed some of those amazing pictures from photo history taken in New Haven, but also um, uh, the Lewis Hine image, um, because everything I'm going to show you is very contemporary. Um, so I'm glad you you got that Frank in there. Um, and I also I want to thank um, the art gallery and um, the festival for inviting me. It's such an honor to be able to um, speak here about the city on the occasion of this incredible exhibition and publication, um, Candy and a Good and Spacious Land. Um, I am not from New Haven, but um, when you go to school somewhere, it becomes a home because it, there are these formative years that happen in college and graduate school. So there's this the second sort of growing up that takes place over, compressed over just a couple years um, that I felt here in graduate school. Um, so although I'm from outside of Philadelphia and I am certainly an outsider, um, I, I feel like New Haven is, is a place that's been very formative for me and very special. And when I moved back here to teach, um, I began photographing, but I felt like I could not possibly do this city justice and I knew that this place is so ripe and full, you know, I loved what you just said about how it's, it's a, a microcosm or a, of America. Um, you know, it, it's a perfect example of, of um, uh, the, the demographics are. Um, so then when, when Jim and Donovan came around and started working on this project, I, I have to say I had such a sense of relief that, <laughs> that I, I wasn't gonna have to make make a, a big photographic project about New Haven because I'm not the right person and I'm not the right photographer and I'm just so I, I have such gratitude to Jim and Donovan and Laura and Chris for making this incredible work so um, anyway uh, also I, I I appreciated that Nicholas mentioned um, the artist as outsider. So even though New Haven is home to me, I also feel that I am an outsider here. But um, I, when I came to Yale from a working class background, I felt 
like and still do, like an outsider at Yale. So I was just um, thinking that in a way, I can really relate to the character of this city, the psyche of this city, having rich and poor, having this incredible inequality and, and sort of having this ivory tower and then the gun factory. You know, th there's, there's sort of a, an ambivalence and a, a crisis in me being someone who is part of Yale, but also comes from this working class background. So I can really, really relate to the, the turmoil that I feel like if the city could feel it, um, the, the, that turmoil is something I could understand. Um, anyway, so I, I wanna show you a lot of pictures today, and I'm gonna show you a lot of pictures pretty quickly. Um, but I wanted to start by, by saying a little bit about um, Chapel Street. Um, I mentioned that graduate school became a real home to me, and the School of Art is just up the block on Chapel. Um, these amazing institutions here and across the street, the British Arts Center, are right here. And I feel like so much of my time, the first time I lived here in New Haven, um, was spent on Chapel Street. And in addition to being a, a, a collector of images with my camera, I'm also a, an avid collector. I don't know if any of you went to Joe Taylor's talk, but um, I, I'm nothing on the scale of Joe in his collecting of New Haven images and postcards. But at flea markets, antique shops, garage sales, I started noticing that when I found carte de visites and cabinet cards, um, the late 19th century studio portraits, so many of them were made on Chapel Street. And so I started collecting them and um, went to the New Haven Historical Society and found that in the 80s, someone else had done research as well as me about who, who the 19th century photographers were in New Haven. And so with that person's research and some elbow grease, I was able to find um, that there were many, many, many photo studios all up and down Chapel Street. And so this is a... Um, you can see the pins down around uh, State and Orange are where most of them were, but they stretched almost as high as uh, High Street here. Um, so I, I avidly tried to find all of the photographers that I was missing on eBay and at flea markets, et cetera, and I, um, I installed them at the Institute Library, um, sort of hanging from, from fishing line. Um, geographically sorted, so it's, it was as if you were walking down a ghostly chapel street in the Institute Library, and then these former citizens of New Haven would be floating, and you'd walk by where their pictures were made. Um, and this was a few years ago, um, and the Institute Library was not a portrait studio because it was a library at the time, and still is, but um, it was very much like the photo studios that would have been neighbors and directly across the street. You know, these brick buildings with lots of glass, these big windows facing Chapel Street. And so here, um, in addition to the photographs, I also started collecting ephemera. And you can see the ads in the New Haven directories um, uh, for the different photographers. So um, anyway, so as, so I'm, I'm a photographer and um, most of what I am interested in or have been interested in the past has to do with escapism and fantasy and recreation. And so the first few photos I'll show you are from my time uh, in graduate school here from 98 to 2000. And when I was assembling these photographs, I realized that all of the pictures uh, that I'll show you from my time at Yale um, are all of places that are either gone, demolished, or very much changed. And I thought that that was a really sort of poignant, interesting moment. Um, this is the York Square Cinema. That's the floor. <laughs> this is the old anchor. And, and um, I started making the work about escapism and fantasy um, while I was a graduate student here. That was my thesis project. Uh, this is the old Rudy's. Oh, sorry. And, uh, and I, the Gotham City Cafe, I assume, is not here. Right, right. This is the back room 
Um, and uh, I made my photographs of bars, nightclubs, movie theaters during the day when they were closed. Um, so this is a back room and you can see the daylight trying to come in, um, but the windows were painted with black paint. So I don't know what all went, went on in this room. Um, anyway, so when I graduated, I, I couldn't get back to Brooklyn, back to New York quickly enough, but an opportunity um, presented itself to come back to Yale and to come back to New Haven. And um, so I, I started teaching here again in 04, but then moved to Fairhaven Heights in 2006 or seven. And um, Fairhaven Heights is not really what one thinks of when they think of New Haven. You think of downtown. Um, Fairhaven Heights is very suburban. It's just over the Quinnipiac River, um, over an amazing 19th century turning bridge um, that, that I'm sure many of you have sat at waiting for a while. <laughs> but it's very charming. Um, and I, I, I kind of didn't really know what to do with myself when I um, got here as far as making pictures because I knew that it was time for a change with my work and I, I wasn't interested in making these same kinds of pictures, interiors, um, you know, strip clubs, nightclubs, et cetera. So I started just meandering about in my neighborhood. Um, and what I was really interested in there are um, these public, these wild wooded public spaces. So there's Fairmont Park, Quarry Park, and the Eugene Far George Preserve. And my house was sort of smack dab in the middle of all of these really incredible public open spaces. Um, and I, I haven't shown this work before. I, it, I, I just sort of didn't really know what to do with it. And it was, um, it, it certainly marked a turning point in my work, sort of going out and using da oops, daylight, um, photographing landscapes uh, rather than interiors and details. And coming back upon this work to make this lecture, I, I really s note the sense of there's a sense of displacement. There's a sense of um, of loneliness. I mean, I think that um, I was certainly displaced as a as someone who was leaving New York and then coming back here. And there was a lot of talk in the uh, lecture last night about disappointment um, and the disappointment of the promise of the model city. And and I was thinking about that word disappointment. Um, and disillusion, looking, looking, looking back through these pictures. And um, I sort of realized that one of the things I felt uh, making this work and going into these incredible wooded, you know, almost completely wild wooded spaces was this sense that, um, you know, I found so much garbage and litter and dumping and it really, it depressed the hell out of me. And I, I, I also had come upon um, the Robert uh, Adams, Art 21, if anyone has seen that, and he talks about contempt, contempt for the environment, contempt for mankind. Um, in, when he talks about a photograph of a beer can on a tree stump chopped down by the side of the road. And that really hit me and I think stuck with me when I was making this work, maybe not consciously, um, but you know, it's not, I, I didn't have the same sense of disappointment in the promise of New Haven as Jim was talking about last night, but it was sort of more of a personal sense of like, oh, I, I've, I'm moving on, I'm an adult now, I have a teaching job, I'm moving out of the city and I have this great 100 year old house and it's surrounded by woods and, and I get into the woods and I, I, I feel like I just find this sort of contemptuous disregard for for this nature. Um, and I also felt that on the streets. You know, I felt that in New Haven, I think there's so much tension. And, and I, I, don't, I don't see why there wouldn't be, but there's this, this tension um, between rich and poor, and I, I sort of felt it all the time on the street. And um, I feel like these pictures kind of poetically represent that, um, that sense of displacement and that sense of, of feeling like there's, there's something I was looking for that I didn't find here. Um, and I called, whoops, I called the series Haven, um, but it, it, the pictures certainly show 
a, a haven that, that doesn't fulfill the promise. So a few more pictures of mine before I move on to student work and, and talk about teaching in New Haven. Um, besides using um, my part of the city as a um, place to explore, I also still sort of went back to my project-based um, making of work, and I would seek out places that had some, that, you know, that there was something there that I thought I could mine. So I passed Strong School all the time in Fairhaven, and the community activist Lee Cruz, who was working on trying to get a, a community arts center going there, uh, gave me access to the former school. So um, over several visits, I made these pictures. Um, and I, I think they certainly sort of harken back to what I was doing in graduate school um, as far as looking at interior spaces. But I think there's also, you know, there is also this, this sense of uh, abandonment and loss. Um, and I, I'm not sure where the Strong School project is at now, but um, when, this was right before, there was sort of this promise, there was this moment where, where it seemed imminent that this wonderful development was gonna happen, um, and then it didn't. Um, I also sought out uh, the Yale Drama uh, Prop Department and Costume Department, and made some pictures there. And Costume Bazaar. Um, which closed, um, they allowed me to come in and photograph in their last few weeks open. Oh, sorry. So, so now I wanna uh, just plow through a whole bunch of student work. And it's, it's been such a, a, a privilege to um, work with students here, uh, both graduate students and undergraduates. And they, Everyone kind of, you know, some students do go other places to make work, but everyone has to kind of figure out a strategy for making work um, in this city. So um, Tim Davis worked in ways similar to, to my former way of working, which is project-based. So he photographed at Yale New Haven Hospital. He also did a series of parking lots. And uh, this amazing series, which um, he, he photographed the, you know, the, these typical New Haven clapboard homes that happen to be now next to fast food chain restaurants. So he found the perfect spot at night to stand so that the, uh, the colonel or whoever is um, reflected in the person's window. <laughs> there's, there's the golden arches. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of these um, from this series. Um, this is an undergraduate I worked with a few years ago um, who was also, he was really interested in humor. He was in one of the Yale improv groups and he made this, um, I don't know if it was still Shaw's at the time or Stop and Shop now, I think, around Halloween. Um, and this work in a way could have been made almost anywhere in America. Um, and I think that's part of the strength of Adam Pape, who graduated just a few years ago, um, uh, went and photographed around the area where the eagles were spotted. Um, and so he photographed all of the wildlife photographers who were coming. Um, so they're all photographing the eagle with these really long lenses, and he's turning his big, giant, unwieldy camera with a, you know, a wide lens at them. And he, he also photographed, um, there, there's his eagle shot, <laughs> which is hopeless, you know, um, as a National Geographic photograph, but it's, it's kind of perfect um, for showing it how, how it really is. Um, and he also photographed um, other representations of the eagle. He also followed around mailmen and, um, somehow created this metaphor uh, between uh, the mailman delivering packages and, and the eagle has landed. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful series and only showing a few doesn't really do it justice. Oops. Um, another 
you know, so you can go out into the city of New Haven and engage, but some Yale students do choose to engage right on campus. So Tommy Cahill, who is pictured on the right here, this is a self-portrait, um, she didn't move into an apartment like most people do when they come to graduate school. She rented a room in a frat house and then decided to make work about it. So her MFA thesis about, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, oops, was, was um, centered around the fraternity brothers that she lived with. I believe this might be in the collection here at the art gallery. And that's snowflakes having fallen on his, his shoulders. Oops, um, sorry. Um, a, a, a student who had just graduated is Matthew Leifheit, um, who was, um, he, he sought out being a photo editor at the YDN, at the Yale Daily News, so that he could have access to the undergraduate world, um, even though he was a graduate student, which is a very separate thing. And he made the, this amazing series, um, which he did produce a book of, um, of this sort of uh, young man's world um, that, that is sort of a fantasy world, um, but also very much still couched in, in the reality of, of this institution. But certainly a, um, a very specific view. Sorry, I think I missed one. Uh, sorry, I'm not, oh well. I'm, I'm clicking too heavily. Um, Jennifer Liu uh, was an undergraduate who um, engaged with the city in a couple different ways. Um, she, uh, with a friend, there was a, a student group uh, that formed a, um, a church group at, let me find it, do, 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 have it written down. There's a, a Korean American uh, Methodist uh, church in Westville. And so she started going with her friends um, who were students and then photographed them in worship and prayer. This is a, a, also a young man in prayer. Uh, Justin Schmitz, instead of photographing Yale students, he actually sought out all of the other uh, colleges and high school students, and he photographed at Toads, as well as at um, local high school football events, um, baseball, et cetera, um, in all the havens, really. New Haven, North Haven, East Haven, West Haven. Um, one of my undergraduates um, took his friends who were Yale students out in much of a Julia Margaret Cameron kind of way and uh, dressed them up in different sort of biblical characters and then took them into Fairhaven and made these really poignant and beautiful photographs on the street. Endia Beale uh, graduated a few years ago and she, like me, was a Yale student, a uh, graduate student with a working class background, and she actually worked full time for IT throughout her whole two years in the uh, graduate school. And so she made work that was very personal, um, and these might, has, might as well be self-portraits, um, where she sought out other women who were working, who were African American women in academia about to go out into the workplace. And so this series is called, um, Is This What You're Looking For? And so she created these workspace backdrops and then brought them into the women's homes and photographed them with studio lighting in front of that. A Monique Atherton, um, she found her subjects on her front porch um, and I'm actually cheating a little bit here because this is West Haven. Um, and Monique, uh, in addition to engaging with 
uh, the, the, the person walking down the street stopping to talk. Um, she also engages with um, the city of New Haven by participating in the local gallery scene at Art Space and also the Eli Center. In fact, she was in residence at Art Space um, in a, a sort of a peep style booth where you could go talk to her. Um, Elaine Stocky is, was a graduate student who is on the faculty now. Um, and she also felt sort of, you know, this, this displacement here and this, this tension uh, coming from a working class background and being in this privileged place. And so she went out on the street and, and she met a man named William um, who was panhandling and then became friends with him and had this intense two-year relationship with him and his family where they were all collaborators on the work. And the series is called Balcony, and they're all made on a family member's balcony. Um, and th there, there isn't any real specific um, political statement she said she was trying to make, but she's just interested in bodies. And they're really, they're really strange and wonderful pictures. And, uh, and I love um, the idea of really collaborating with your subjects um, as if it's a theatrical production, like a community theater or something. Marjana Abramovic, um, she found people on the street and through ads um, with just strange and wonderful beauty. And uh, some of her subjects are even people that um, uh, not here, but but on her website, there are people you might even recognize as New Haven fixtures. And she photographs them in, in this sort of very over dramatic and strange, uncanny way with studio lighting out in the landscape. So, you know, you can, you can engage with the city, I think, um, on a one-to-one -one basis, you know, by, by the people that you meet and the people that you, you know, I, I think by photographing someone, um, Nan Golden always said uh, a photograph is like a caress. You know, there's, there's something very deep and strong, I think, about um, the intimate relationship between a photographer and a subject, even if it is a fleeting moment or a two-year period. I think it really means a lot to someone to be treated in such a serious way photographed. Um, and, and it's sort of a two-way street. I mean, I think the photographer is clear, clearly getting a lot out of the interaction, but I think the people that we photograph are as well. This is another image by uh, Jen Liu um, that she actually um, was sent out um, on an article for Yale's New Journal. Um, and he photographed Ramon and his family um, who had been moved out of the Church Street South housing projects, housing um, center, when it was deemed uninhabitable. And at the time that she photographed him and his family, they were living in a hotel in Hamden. And these are such beautiful, tender portraits that she made. Curran Hadelberg, this is one of my favorite all-time New Haven pictures. It's just... You know, there's this median strip in the center of the road, and then these two people are um, reading uh, amidst the litter, and it's almost like they're they're in this reverse oasis or something. But they seem really at peace, which is why I love it. Um, one of my undergraduates photographed uh, Dennis and his young family. Um, Dennis is is a New Haven fixture. Um, I actually, I wasn't able to get work by this student, but one of my undergraduates made New Haven uh, trading cards, like baseball cards. Uh, I think Dennis was one of them. Um, I, I put Greg Hindi in here because I, I want as many people to know about him as possible. He, he is, um, here he is walking uh, back into New Haven after walking across the United States and back with a vow of silence and a large format four by five view camera um, in a cart. Uh, so hence the beard. Um, but Greg was not a, a photography major, not an art major. He was actually a cognitive science major who took photography and went to the flea market, which I think is now defunct. I 
could be wrong. Um, but went to the New Haven flea market and started photographing um, voraciously. And I don't have those photos because I can't get in touch with Greg because now he's walking the Pan American Highway. <laughs> so there's no way to get in touch with him. But, um, but he's a really interesting character, so you should look him up and I think stay tuned. <laughs> but he's an example of someone who engaged with the people of New Haven and really just fell in love with them and fell in love with the idea of photography as a tool for humanism, a tool for knowing yourself but also knowing your community. Um, Sam Cryer just took these last semester in my intro photo class. Um, you know, in intro photo, I really feel like my job is, uh, my job is to teach someone how to see you know, to teach them who they are, to teach them, you know, how to see the world around them clearly and explain and communicate how they feel about it. Um, and what I do in order just to get people sort of started um, is give them a few assignments that are very much based in the flaneur tradition, you know, the walking tradition, the walking with a camera alone, um, thinking poetic thoughts <laughs> tradition. And so some of the assignments I give um, are, um, they have to, in one week, they have to take three, three roles, one role in one neighborhood, another role in another distinct neighborhood, and then I think a third in, an, in yet another distinct neighborhood. And I'm just trying to get them to go out of their comfort zone, but also to um, think about how they define different neighborhoods and how they define difference. Um, so it's interesting, usually they come back with very economically different neighborhoods, but a lot of times it is more subtle. Um, another assignment uh, is that they have to photograph a stranger. And they hate that, but they love it. <laughs> and I'll show you some, uh, well this, this person was certainly a stranger to Tom Gardner. Um, and I'm actually cheating again here because this is West Haven again. It's a stone's throw. And Thomas was making uh, these with a very large 8x10 view camera and printing them very big and very, very lush and beautiful. Um, this is Noah Dobin Bernstein again. Um, these next couple are, are certainly from that stranger assignment. Um, and my students do tend to, they go to the green, they go to the bus stops, um, and those that really take to this assignment really, I, I think it changes them somehow. You know, this being forced to, in, to interact with and make a respectful portrait of someone who they don't know. Um, I think it really, it, really, it really changes how they think about their world and their place in it. Coming to the end, this is the last photographer I want to show you, um, Erica West, who, like Greg Hindi, was someone with an entirely different major, and she took a photo class and and pushed herself and realized that this was the medium that, you know, this is this is what she wanted to spend her life doing. Um, and she first photographed signs um, around Dwight. This says, "Tell all the children art story," and then there's a bullet hole in the middle. And Erica um, has gone on to do a lot of community work, uh, the after school arts program through ACES. Um, and uh, she also worked, whoops, sorry. We worked with our man, Jim. Um, I think this is at Hill House. Um, they, they photographed and worked with kids in Hill House and Hopkins, two diff very different schools, and just to sort of see how, um, how there were differences and similarities. Um, and Erica's going on to a post back program, and I think I think she'll she'll certainly take with her um, the experience of working with kids in New Haven, which a lot of my students have done. I just didn't have access to the other work. All right, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. Let's see here. Um, 
Good, yeah. Uh, I just want to say thanks also to the festival and uh, to the art gallery and to um, the team behind Candy, uh, A Good and Spacious Land. It is an unbelievable accomplishment. I'm totally blown away with what they were able to, um, <laughs> to do with that. Uh, and I'm just like eating the books alive. It's absolutely incredible and everyone really should take a look at it. And I thought in that context of thinking about Candy, a good and spacious land, and the model city, that it would be appropriate to look uh, briefly at some of the very powerful, very persuasive visual imagery that was so much a part of the making of the model city and urban redevelopment in the first place. Um, you know, images like this, where the after is meant to suggest the accomplishment. Uh, of course, our eyes look at it entirely differently, doesn't it? Many of us want to go back. We, we want to have the before, because that speaks to the continuous system of streets and all of the uh, visual density and, uh, and social lives and interest of, of that city. And the right to us looks, looks dull and, and looks strange. Uh, but for the people of the redevelopment agency in the 50s and 60s and those who were advancing the ideas of redevelopment in the model city, the goal was to produce the landscape that we see uh, on the right. I mean, in some sense, we're lucky that it was only as much as they did. I mean, imagine if they had accomplished this image of proposed development for the southwest area of Connecticut, a series of plans produced by Maurice Rotival, the um, Le Corbusier, um, sort of an acolyte of, of the modernist Le Corbusier who came to New Haven to teach at Yale and to produce plans for the city of New Haven uh, during the 1940s, where they were already doing wartime, wartime planning. Uh, I mean, the, the image, the idea is incredibly striking that outside of some blocks around the nine squares themselves, which you can clearly see there, the entire city uh, might, might just as well be, be wiped off and, and remade in one, in one form or another. And given the ambition of plans like these, we should maybe be, be thankful in some sense that only so much of it was made. I mean, the context of what was produced was, was made in this context, where so much of the existing city was deemed worthy of, of erasure. Um, it made perfect sense. And again, another one of these powerful kind of propaganda images of imaging the city in the 50, 40s, 50s, and 60s, it made perfect sense uh, to think about recasting the city in this way. It was all part of the natural process of urbanism and the way that people moved through the city and region, uh, from ships coming into the harbor um, to the advent of railroads, the beginnings of automobiles, and now finally, 1940X to 19XX, airplanes, plastics, television, and yes, the new landscape to go along with all of that. Powerful, powerful images to help build consensus, to build desire for the new post-war landscape. But they were also playful in their images in some sense, or if not, not playful, uh, um, kind of um, illustrative in this way. Now, I, I actually find this image to be fascinating. On the one hand, it brings together the, the class, race, and gender-based um, ideas uh, that were so much behind the changes of urban renewal. That now, New Haven, as the major commercial center of the region, was competing with these new regional shopping centers. And the white, middle-class housewife had many places where she might choose to spend her, her shopping dollars. How could we lure her into the city itself? How could we persuade her to shop not in Wallingford or in Madison or, or Milford, but to come into New Haven, this, this sort of, uh, I don't know, Stepford wife kind of character that was so much part of the image of who we wanted to come into the city, the planners did at that time, to rescue New Haven, or so they thought, as the great commercial capital. How to do it? The pulling power. <laughs> of 9,850 parking spaces. We would literally pull them into the city with incredible new pieces of civic infrastructure like the Temple Street Garage that you see here. And architects' renderings of these, of these places were also uh, vitally important images uh, in thinking about what the future of the city would be. And here we see Paul Rudolph's image, this, this bold intention of a new piece of civic infrastructure. 
Um, he's famous for drawings. It's not great resolution uh, here, unfortunately. But look at all of the social activity that he imagines in the kind of great modern poured concrete portico that is, in fact, still a part of, of the Temple Street Garage. Now, now I know that not everybody loves uh, the Temple Street <laughs> Garage. Some people find it to be um, a, a little bombastic or inhumane uh, in, in one form or another. It may not be the active social space that Paul Rudolph had. But, but I actually am mounting a campaign that it is the sexiest building in Connecticut. <laughs> it is an amazing structure. Uh, and putting aside for a moment what was lost when it was made, what was removed to create the, the massive urban parcel that was reanimated with, with this new building, P putting that aside for, for a moment, go to the Temple Street garage and, and embrace it in this kind of grandeur as this piece of, of civic infrastructure. Uh, it really is quite amazing. And, and I, am, I am always trying to get people more and more to appreciate that kind of exposed concrete architecture that, that has been maligned as brutalism and brutal, and some of it is, but it really um, has something going for it. So join me. <laughs> the sexiest building in Connecticut. Can we, can we mount a campaign? Um, but, uh, but of course, it's absolutely vital. This is something that Donovan spoke about, and of course, his incredible body of work on uh, the, the, the new merge, uh, the doubling down on, uh, on automobile and highway infrastructure that's just been completed here. Despite everything we say about wanting more transit and trains, what is the biggest new piece of civic infrastructure in New Haven? It's the merge. It's this epic new flyover. And it was all part of connecting New Haven to this emerging new network, right? You had to plug in, which is exactly what the Oak Street Connector was designed to do. And if you didn't plug into that network, you were going to be cut out. And you would risk becoming a ghost town. You'd, you'd risk be becoming irrelevant in the emerging hierarchy uh, of post-war urban metropolitan places. So our Oak Street Connector, it's our plug we plug in to the network just in, this, just in this way. You can see on the right-hand side that I-91 has not been completed yet. They're just clearing all of that land to the east of Worcester Square in this image. And when it was made, it was a dream come true to make that connection into that broader, into that broader uh, uh, network, as, as again, as strange to our eyes as this image may seem. So my students looked at this space of the Oak Street Connector itself and attempted to use some of the material from the propaganda to sort of detour or reposition or recast this information, repopulate the landscape uh, with some of the, the descriptions of these places, and they produced um, a kind of what I like to think of as historical wayfinding signage. It's signage all around the connector itself that draws on the rhetoric that was used to produce it in the first place. Um, and so what they, they did was they took um, these quotes, uh, not every structure in this area is substandard, but like cutting a rotten spot from an apple, some of the good has to be cut away to save the whole. Very much part of the logic of the, of the planners at that time. So they kind of produced this wayfinding signage, sort of a, a non-instrumental form of wayfinding signage and a way of finding your, your way back into the past in one form or another. Um, and there were several examples um, of these, all, all quotes or, or based on their own research, and they interspersed them and had that kind of map that brought them all together. I like this. Um, illustration, this image of it, because it shows how these uh, signs became part of the cacophony of, of signage in the street a, a, in general. Uh, and this talks about how the very important Berman versus Parker Supreme Court case at 54 is one of the triggers that begins to allow the, the very vigorous use of eminent domain to uh, claim private parcels uh, for the public good. And again, the public good here being if we don't build the highway, the entire city is going to collapse. So a few people are going to have to forfeit their property in order to produce this vital new link. 
And uh, most of the signs, I think maybe all of the signs are finally gone. They, they lingered actually for many, many months and weathered and I would go around and find them and prop them back up and I think almost all of them perhaps are gone now. They had their own kind of lovely afterlife. But you would, you would see people looking at them and uh, this woman told me that I like it, it's different, I'll have to look around more closely. And that's really exactly the purpose of, of this kind of intervention, is to get people to look at the landscape around them just a little bit more closely. And when you do begin to examine these, these landscapes, again, and, and to do the kinds of, um, of activities that, that Jim and Donovan did so, uh, so beautifully and successfully in their work, you begin to find these moments and strange, interesting things that are part of an otherwise forgotten part of, of the landscape. Uh, it occurs to me in some sense that the space of the connector now, as it begins to be remade and rebuilt with the Alexion headquarters now as our kind of flagship project that's meant to rebuild over the gash of the connector to reconnect the fabrics of the city, um, that it is this kind of nascent transitional greens word. It is a kind of park nestled between these iconic corporate towers. It is a kind of good and spacious land in some sense. And you just want to jump over the barriers and just roll all over the grass and the green and get into that good and spacious land somehow to activate it, or at least I do. And we'll have to see how it is as it kind of, kind of moves forward here. And so when you see this image, and Chris mentioned exactly this quote last night um, that the, from the Secretary of Labor in 64, he says, New Haven is the greatest success story in the history of the world, now shown in juxtaposition to the new infrastructure, the new images around the Oak Street connector. Um, so when you see this now, do we think, wow, is the city moving in the right direction? Look at this wonderful new bike path here. Here are new buildings helping to, to bridge that divide. So bringing the voice of the past into conversation with the present and getting people to think um, about, about what happened and, and what continues to happen. These are the kinds of projects I like to try to facilitate for my students um, because as, as you know, students at Yale are coming through. Every year we are teaching them again about this moment, again about urban renewal. Um, we have to continue to retell the story uh, every single year and it becomes a kind of ritual to continue to, to talk about it. Um, Oh, and oh yes, we always try to get a little bit of press for it if we can to make sure that these projects live on or are amplified uh, through the way people, people talk about them. Uh, so we have a Highway 34 uh, revisited article here. Now, uh, many of you may know that one of the Yale School of Architecture's um, most uh, important and um, um, visible forms of engagement in the community is the building project. Uh, and many of our, uh, uh, and it's a wonderful tradition and it continues to become more interesting and more complex in many ways, but many of our students are taking a critical view towards the building project, thinking about how the buildings are perceived in the neighborhood, and even thinking about how to do a post-occupancy evaluation of these places to see if folks actually like living in them. You know, New Haven has such an amazing uh, vernacular fabric of housing types here. It's hard to reinvent it in some sense, but yet every year we try. Uh, and if you go to the New Haven Green over this weekend and in the next coming days, you can meet Yale School of Architecture students working on the building project um, and talk to them about housing and some of these projects. So look for them on the green. But one of the things that we like to do is to get, um, or that I like to do, is to get these uh, architecture students to look at other types of buildings and conditions in the city, not necessarily building new buildings, but looking at the, uh, the stock of old and disused or under, uh, underused or underappreciated buildings in the city, like the New Haven Clock Company buildings on Hamilton Street, um, most of which now sit, sit empty and they're, they're quite um, dramatic and beautiful even in the way the windows are now boarded in, in the, red, the red wood. Um, there are efforts going on now to, to try to make something happen in those spaces and, and we'll follow it. But one of the things that we do is to examine these landscapes 
and to begin to uh, research them and interpret them. Um, the height of them, how they were made, how they helped build up the city, and their decline, deindustrialization, disinvestment, dormancy, but then also the kind of invitation of dormancy. Uh, there are many afterlives that these buildings have after their um, modus operandi has already passed from the scene. Um, it's not entirely uh, empty, I should say. There is a cabaret uh, there. Uh, it's changed since this one and you have all of this kind of uh, uncanny architectural effects here um, of, of, de, of defenestrating, I suppose, this part of the, uh, the building. But in any event, we go out and look at these uh, places and we, we, uh, we walk through them and photograph them where the, the relics of so all of these social activities, many of which sort of remain, and we begin to research them. Many of you are familiar with Sanborn maps, the fire insurance maps. They are fascinating. You could, you could lock me in a room for the rest of my life with Sanborn maps. I would be happy. <laughs> They are so fascinating, they are so rich, they are so dense. And when you go to the New Haven Museum or the Institute Library or Yale to look at some of them, and you find the ones where they've been pasted over because the Sanborn Company sent out their field agents to mark changes every few years, and they're pasted over as this just absolutely fascinating palimpsest of activities to begin to reconstruct what has happened over, over time in these places, or the promotional imagery again, of the city to show New Haven as a bustling industrial place, or to look at these places as working sites and the kind of life um, that occurred on a day-to-day -day basis inside of these, of these buildings. Um, or to have the opportunity, again, at the New Haven uh, Museum, one of our great institutions here and great for local research, uh, these wonderful kind of Art Deco era um, catalogs for the New Haven clocks. The New Haven Clock Company even goes to war uh, in the 1940s as they begin to shift their production, not only to include clocks, but also war production, radio, fuses, time switches, and aviation instruments. Um, of course, so much of American industry was converted to wartime uses uh, su such as these. But after the heyday of the New Haven Clock Company, after it wanes from the scene, you have this incredible building and it becomes open to new uses. You begin to have artists and people living there early, um, loft living in New Haven, occurring in the 70s and 80s in a place like the New Haven Clock Company. You have Dmitry Rimsky, who came and spoke to our class, and we interviewed him and others um, who lived there with him. Uh, Dmitry had a mime troupe. Uh, you can see he's not leaning on anything. Um, <laughs> But there he is in his loft in the clock factory, part of the afterlives. And, and stranger afterlives too, the badass white boys motorcycle club used to meet in the New Haven clock uh, factory and relics, remnants of their uh, clubhouse is, is there as well. Um, many of the, uh, uh, there is a room in the clock factory and uh, that is poignant and strange and, and sad and also um, kind of um, uh, um, light in its way too, where the dancers at the cabaret would leave notes to each other um, and they've recorded this kind of conversation between the people that have come to work as, as dancers and performers in the cabaret and in the, in the club that again occupies part of that, that building. So again, a group of students decided to take this research and to reanimate the space in one form or another, uh, to invite people to come there, to place it into a broader geography, to produce a kind of pamphlet to talk about some of the things they had, they had found, um, to open the doors to this place, to let people come in and explore, and we took tours through the entire building as well, and then to project some of this imagery back onto the spaces itself, to kind of reanimate it with, with yes, the ghosts of its past somehow, with the people that passed through those spaces, and now even in a very small way, this, the newest kind of animation of, of that space. Oh, and look, we get a little coverage for that too, and it's, uh, yeah, it's the ghosts of the of the of the factory are are, are uh, of the clock factory are are coming back, and that was something that we 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 really wanted to to try to do. Um, one project that we worked on for several years was all about Crown Street, interactive Crown Street. Really, uh, at Crown Street, one of the most fascinating, one of the most interesting cities uh, uh, streets in the city. It's only eight blocks from State to Howe, and and there it is. You can read almost the entire history of the city on Crown Street. Um, we're all ready to go uh, for those of you who want to work with us on a, on a book all about 
Crown Street. Uh, and we had the opportunity to install in empty storefronts uh, that building with the Cooper's Feminine Apparel building. That's gone. That's now the whole new um, uh, uh, sort of impressive new uh, apartment structure there. The, the College Crown uh, apartment building is there. This 1950s two-story building is gone. And then on Crown Street, uh, again, uh, the following year, we, we installed in a storefront. And students came up with all kinds of uh, ways to engage people in the history and planning and meaning of the street, uh, teaching people about cognitive maps, having a sound study, sort of like pin the sound on the street, uh, looking at, at, at historical imagery, doing a kind of walkability study, all of these kinds of studies. But what uh, taking community stories and getting interviews about the street and people's uh, memories of the street, but, but the kind of unifying element was what we called the Crown Street Collective Memory Palimpsest, uh, which I realize is probably a little bit more wordy than is necessary. But the idea being is here's this blank template. Let's fill it up with everything we know about Crown Street and, and create a collective representation of that place to evoke Crown Street as a place that is both shared uh, as well as contested in many ways. And to, make, um, and to make the point in some sense that the city is not, um, is not singular. Uh, the city is plural. Um, and all of our cities are real. Uh, each is equally authentic. Uh, and together, we can kind of acknowledge the fact that we have different memories and images of the city and make one big palimpsestic kind of jump, jumble of it all. So it wasn't a palimpsest in the sense that there was very much erasure. It was more just like, you know, a palimpsest, you would write and erase and write again. Um, the Sanborn maps are palimpsests. But, uh, but in any event, uh, this is what we, we produced. In closing, I just want to uh, say I'm very excited about this new project that's, uh, that's just coming online, uh, working for many years uh, on this New Haven building archive. The Digital Humanities Lab at Yale has propelled it forward now. Students researching individual buildings in the city, but it's not a static archive of buildings in the city. It is a growing archive. It is a changing archive. And it will be open for all of you to um, add your own uh, um, information or descriptions or memories of, of different buildings in the city to really build it up in that way. A place like Ferraro's Market, for example, is on there. They use some of this imagery to do research. And I'm just so excited because it becomes a research tool as you begin to look at buildings around the city. And just very, and just to close here, in the fall, our next project is going to be part of the Citywide Open Studios um, at the Gough Street Armory, where, we'll, where we will be excavating the armory. Uh, and doing a project there. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Wow, wow, thank you so much, Nikki, Lisa, Elihu, for those um, incredibly generous and thoughtful presentations. We're running uh, long, we're running too long for our conversation on stage. I, I think that all of our speakers will stay for 10 minutes or so to answer individual questions. Um, I do want to just wrap up by trying to um, tie the two programs together a little bit. Uh, when Candy and a Good and Spacious Land started, it started as a very open-ended residency for the two artists, Jim Goldberg and Donovan Wiley. It became collaborative very quickly. It didn't have a set end point. The exploration of New Haven was one that we at the Yale Art Gallery knew we wanted to engage in. We wanted to partner with the artists and the writers in this exploration. And as the work progressed, and became so clearly important and powerful. We knew we wanted these projects to be published. And there was a really critical juncture in here, and that was that the gallery was a platform for the artists going out into the city, creating this incredibly rich portrait for the research that the authors were doing, the contextualization of the city in which the gallery lives. And every step of the way, we at the gallery were learning more and more about our city. And at, at the point that the books were really coming together, it was clear 
that it was so important for us to do an exhibition here at the museum and bring this portrait, bring this, these bodies of work back into the museum and have that reciprocal relationship be part of this endeavor, a big part of this endeavor. So I'm not speaking specifically to what any of you have said today, um, uh, just due to shortness of time, but I do think the notion of public space, the way that this museum, the Yale Center for British Art across the street, other institutions in the city function as a place for us all to come together, not only in being free and open to the public and um, free and open to the public, but also in the content that we collaboratively generate um, among all of us. And I think that these two programs, last night and today, are a, a you know, great example of that kind of work. And I thank all seven of you presenters um, from the bottom of my heart, and I hope it continues because it's very, very important. Um, and and this, this city is, is our home, and it's the home of the gallery, and it's, it's all of our home, and um, I hope we'll just continue to engage. So thank you.